There's a place in the Bible called heaven, I know, and one thing's for sure, I'm ready to go, but I want to look on my sweet Savior's face and thank Him for saving me.
be in church this morning and looking forward to Brother David preaching for us. Brother Tony is uh, down in Georgia with, uh, with Brother Jesse preaching down there tonight. So let's go ahead and sing out good this evening. 147, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, that uh, we can lean on you when we're going through hardships in life, Lord. And thank you that uh, uh, because of being a Christian and having the Holy Spirit living inside us, God, that we can get comfort, we can get strength uh, from your Holy Spirit. What a blessing that is, Lord, as I know a lot of people in here. And Lord, when we go over this prayer list in just a minute, Lord, there's a lot of people uh, that are close to us that are having hard times, God. And I just pray that you'd watch over and help each one of those uh, requests they're going to mention in a minute. And I pray, Lord, that you'd bless Brother Tony as he's going to be preaching tonight and then driving home and getting in late. I pray, God, that you would bless him. ask God that you would uh, anoint him with uh, your Holy Spirit and power and give him a safe trip home. And ask God that uh, you'd be in the service tonight. Looking forward to Brother David uh, preaching. And I just ask God that you would fill him with your Holy Spirit also. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, uh, let's go over to uh, 365. Tell it to Jesus.
I said, Brother Tony is out of town, and uh, Brother Matt has another bout going on with his voice where he doesn't have any. Uh, so he said, Brother, you have got it all tonight, so I get to do the singing and the praying and the I'm not going to do the preaching. Looking forward to Brother David here in a minute. Um, but uh, when we come to the altar here in just a minute, please uh, do take some time. I'm sure some of you have probably had a crazy day today, and it takes a little bit of breathing deep and uh, seeking the Lord for a few minutes. So when we come to the altar here, and let's pray and let's talk to him and just kind of clear our head from the busyness of the day and uh, try and get something from the, the preaching and the, the special that we'll be hearing Brother Matt here in just a minute. Uh, so uh, some of the prayer requests, of course, is youth rally. Uh, a lot of logistics involved in that. I've got the prayer list up here. Uh, please be praying over that. And uh, then also keep in mind that... Uh, um, Shirley Ward, be praying for her uh, with her cancer treatment, as well as Greg Johnson. And then Brother Arnold, he is going to be having surgery uh, next month. Keep these folks in mind. And then uh, uh, also be praying for uh, Tanya McIntosh. Uh, this is Janet Fisher's uh, daughter-in-law that is having some very serious complications with uh, the port where she has getting dialysis, and they've moved it several times and they're literally running out of veins to use, so be praying for her if you would. And then some of the hotlines this week, uh, Kayla Norris asked us to be praying for Marilia as uh, says that she got strep throat and then it turned into scarlet fever and then she ended up busting an eardrum. Uh, so she is very sick, so be praying for her as well as uh, Mays because he had his tonsils out last week and they don't want him to catch any of this. So uh, pray the Lord to watch over them and uh, heal up Marilia and keep them all, anybody else from getting sick. And then uh, Christy Wilson asked us to be praying for Gracie, their daughter, as uh, she had wisdom teeth pulled out the other day and had to have oral surgery for that and pray that uh, her recovery uh, would go smooth. And then also uh, praying for uh, Mandy Edwards' uncle as uh, he has got very serious things going on. He's got heart condition. Uh, he's needing a back surgery, and he's also got cancer. So uh, please be praying for him. And then uh, Gary Bartlett, he is having another uh, cancer surgery tomorrow. Be praying that that goes smoothly and there's no complications there. And then uh, uh, once again, just keep in mind for the youth rally as we try to get prepared for that. We want the Holy Spirit in the services more than anything. We can do all the preparations we want to do and I appreciate the ones that have been working on that. We've got uh, ladies sewing a uh, circus tent and then we are going to try and assemble it, and hopefully it will all go together and make a, something that looks like a circus tent. So be praying uh, that all the logistics of that work out, but more important, be praying that the Holy Spirit would be there and that uh, we would have some good services. So let's, uh, let's come to the altar, and let's take a few minutes and try and uh, uh, clear our mind from the busyness of the day. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, that uh, we can come to church, Lord, and just try and uh, breathe out a little bit of craziness of the day, Lord, and hear from you. And I just pray, Lord, that you would uh, bless Brother uh, Matt Demick as he's going to be singing in a minute. I pray, Lord, that you would bless his song. Looking forward to Brother David uh, teaching and preaching for us here in just a minute, Lord. And I just pray that you would uh, give him liberty, fill him with your Holy Spirit, and maybe we be receptive to the truth that's going to be preached, Lord. Ask God that you would watch over uh, Charlie and watch over uh, Brother Tony as uh, they will be uh, preaching this evening and driving back tonight. I believe Charlie is also preaching and Brother Tony is preaching down there at Brother Jesse. Keep them safe as they travel home. Ask God that uh, you would uh, watch over the youth rally, Lord, as we are doing preparations, Lord. I know folks have been fasting the last week or so and going to be fasting this coming week. And uh, just praying for your presence and praying for your power and asking for the a whole list of things here, Lord, for protection of the travelers, Lord, for the, all the uh, sound equipment and the heating and the cooling and there'd be no disturbances, Lord. There wouldn't be any problems with 
the management over at Ridgecrest with anything that we do. And sometimes we get a little bit crazy with the skits, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, that there would be no hindrances in any of the services in any way, God. We just pray for your presence, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we get to do this. And I just pray that it would change some young people's lives, God, for eternity. And, Lord, I ask that you would watch over uh, the ones that are fighting cancer. I pray, Lord, that you would be with Miss Shirley. And I pray, Lord, that you would uh, be with Brother Greg and uh, Brother Arnold as he's going to be having surgery soon, Lord. And uh, the other ones in the church here, Lord, for Miss Sheila and Miss Wendy and Brother Boyce. And I just pray, God, that you'd be with each one of them as they're fighting different forms of cancer and in different treatments. I just pray, God, that you would... Uh, be with each one of them. And Lord, I pray for Tim Banks as he's supposed to be having surgery real soon. Lord, I pray that you'd help there not to be any complications there. And Lord, I know that uh, Easter is this Sunday and I know that the uh, uh, buses are going to have a special day for the bus kids that day. And I pray that they'd have a good day there and have a lot of extra riders and maybe somebody would get saved. And I just pray that you give them a good day for uh, this coming Sunday. Lord, I pray for wisdom and direction about all the, uh, the finances, things around the church, Lord, with uh, uh, the camp, the property that uh, we're potentially going to be purchasing. I pray that you give us direction there. And, Lord, the finishing up the parking lot, Lord, and the new roof. And I pray, God, that you would help us to have wisdom in all these areas, Lord, and direction from you. And, Lord, as uh, I mentioned last week about all the craziness going on in, in Haiti, I pray that you watch over Brother uh, uh, Norcellus, Lord, and watch over Brother Maurice Lapierre. I pray, God, that you bless these men and their ministries down there. And I hate to hear about all of the uh, uh, gang violence, Lord, and I just pray that you'd protect them. And Lord, watch over Tanya McIntosh, and I pray that you give them wisdom to help her with her dialysis. And Lord, for Michaela Swan, Lord, I know that she had a, an injection, Lord, trying to help her with her hip issues yesterday. And Lord, she's in a lot of pain from that today. I pray that you would uh, help that to clear up. Lord, I pray that you watch over Marilia, Lord. I hate to hear about her being so sick, God. And uh, I pray, pray, Lord, that you give the doctors wisdom and how to treat her and uh, help her ear to heal up. And just pray that uh, nobody else in the family would get sick. And Lord, watch over Gracie as she is uh, recovering from her uh, oral surgery, Lord. And Lord, for uh, Mandy's uncle, Lord, I pray that you'd be with him. Um, I think his name is Bud. I pray, God, that you would uh, help him, Lord, uh, as he is fighting all these physical battles. And, Lord, for Gary Bartlett, Lord, as he is going to be having surgery tomorrow, I ask that that would go smooth. And I know, Lord, that uh, the one he had a couple weeks ago went well. And I pray that uh, there would be no complications tomorrow. And, Lord, I just love you. And thank you, Lord, that uh, we have a great church to come to, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, for uh, our preacher. And I thank you, Lord, for all the congregation here, Lord, that seeks you, God, because... One person doesn't make a great church, Lord, but you do. And I know, Lord, you are uh, uh, sought by the congregation here. And what a blessing that is, Lord, for you showing up. We love you and thank you for your goodness. In Christ's name, amen. All right, just a couple announcements. And Matt, if you'd go ahead and come on and get ready. Do remember that we have got um, uh, visitation Saturday at 10 o'clock. Plan on being here for that as well as, they probably put a call out later on in the week, but Friday we are having a late night prayer meeting uh, specifically for the youth rally, and that will be from 8 to 11. If you can come for the whole time, that would be great. If you want to come by for an hour or two, that would be a blessing. Uh, but remember that, uh, Friday from 8 to 11. When I look around and see the good things He's done for me, I know I'm unworthy of them all But His blessings He freely gives I owe My whole life to Him I've got so much
So many times we just uh, get used to our routine life, and uh, we do need to think uh, think about how much we have been blessed and how uh, our life could be so much different. As I said Sunday, all we had to be do, all that had to happen is us be born in a different country. And you talk about having your life so much different. Uh, we are blessed to be Americans. We are blessed to be born in uh, uh, America and then living in the South, going to a great church. And, uh, you know, we've got uh, church plants, different places across the country, especially in the Northeast and way out West, uh, where there's not a good church, you know, maybe for a couple hundred miles. And we've got lots of good churches here in the county. What a blessing that is. All right, Brother David, come on. Looking forward to you preaching this evening. Right. Good evening. Hello. Good evening. Good to be in church. Thank the Lord for church. Turn, if, if you would, to Luke chapter 24. Luke 24. I, I do appreciate the opportunity. The Tony text yesterday and uh, makes me nervous every time, but I appreciate the opportunity. To stand for the Lord and to uh, look at His Word. Thank the Lord that we have His Word available to us in the English language. <laughs> it's like in the other day, uh, if you speak Hebrew, that's good, but you only got one part of the scriptures. If you speak Greek, you only have the other part, or maybe not even all of it. And you got Aramaic, then you only got a little portion of it, but you don't have to know any of those languages. You know English. King James Version of the Bible has it all. Thank God for that, for the entire inspired Word of God. Thank the Lord for that. I hope you read it. I hope it's precious to it. A lot of people paid a great price for it. Thank God for it. Thank God for that. Luke 24, verse number 13. We'll start reading there. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. And they talked together all of these, and they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. That's a good thing to happen right there. But their, their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as you walk and are sad? They're walking along. And they're sad. Verse number 18. And the one, and the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, uh, and to the best of my uh, digging and understanding, it, this is uh, the brother of Joseph, essentially, uh, if you will, the, the uncle of the Lord. I, I don't know that that's, that's, I had multiple sources that said that, that I read. Cleopas, so that, that's who it is here, but he's nonetheless, he's a disciple. We see that from verse number 13, and behold, two of them, them referring to disciples, not, not, not of the 12, but probably of the 70. Verse number 18, answering, so this is Cleopas, answering the Lord and said unto them, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? Hast thou not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto, and I didn't mean to go to Luke and start looking at questions. I, that just just so happened because you know, Brother Tony's been preaching on the questions. That was not not intentional. I'm not going to look at that question tonight. Maybe he'll address it. But uh, what things? And they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. So they're telling Jesus, is, is, this is what they were talking about. And, and Jesus said, well, what are you talking about? Why are you sad? What things? And they go on and they say in verse number 19, verse number 20, and then verse number 21. But we trusted, we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since the things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our country made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came again or they came saying that 
They had also seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive. Thank God that he is alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even as it, as so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, believe, heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And, and, and look, I know it's a lot of reading here tonight, and I, I normally don't read a lot, but look at verse number 27. Verse number 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto... This is Jesus. He, and beginning at Moses and, and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the thing concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, Emmaus. And he made as though he would have gone further... But they constrained him and saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them, and it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them. Lord, I love you tonight. Lord, I thank you for salvation. Lord, I, I, I'm grateful that I got to be a part of your great family. I'm grateful for this church. Lord, thank you for New Manna, the, the heritage that I have. Lord, I'm grateful for that. Lord, and the, uh, the history that I, that I have here with, uh, with my parents and uh, I'm grateful to have been raised in church. Lord, I'm grateful to have known the scriptures since, since I was little. Lord, I'm thankful for that. Thank you for that heritage. Thank you for that testimony. I pray, I, I pray that you'd help me tonight, Lord. Help me to help your people. Our church, they really need you. Lord, we need you right now real bad. So I pray that you'd come. You'd help us. Please, Lord, I pray you'd help me to speak and just be a blessing to your people. You sure are worthy. So I pray you'd help us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. In these passages, we have an account of the resurrected physical body of Jesus Christ. And the fact that he rose from the dead is the foundational. Listen, it is the foundational truth of our faith. I think every time that I, that I stand in Sunday school or I stand somewhere to, to read and to teach or, or whatever it is to deliver the thought, I think almost every time I, I make it a point to, to mention the gospel. Because it, without the gospel, we, we, don't, have, we don't have anything. We do, we, as Gentiles, we, we don't have anything. 1 Corinthians 15, 14, the Bible says... And this is what Paul said about the gospel, about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. He said, if you didn't get up, now I, I didn't intend for this to be the Wednesday before, uh, before Easter. It just so happened this was the thought that the Lord actually gave me on the way to work the other day. And then Brother Tony texted me, and I was like, Lord to God, I know, I know when I need to, to use this and, and present this or, or declare this, but... It just so happened that, that this was the passage that he put on my heart. But Paul said, if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. As a matter of fact, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is one of the three components of the gospel. Now, this is not a lesson or message or thought on the gospel, but it's important to note that the resurrection is, in fact, one of the three components of the gospel, which Paul defines in 1 Corinthians 15. If you want to know what the Bible says about what the gospel is, there, there's no guessing. There's no, uh, it's, it's defined clearly by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, chapter 15, verse number 1. It says, Moreover, brethren, I, Paul, declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you which also you have received and wherein you stand. Here he says by which also ye are saved. By what? By the gospel. And in verse number 3, for I delivered unto you first of all that which, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. That's a great statement that, that Jesus died for our sins. We, we couldn't pay the price for sin. I couldn't pay the price for my sin. The only way that I could pay it would be to spend eternity in hell trying to pay it for eternity and it would never would have been paid off but I did not have 
have to pay for my sins. But if you left it there, that puts us in a category with a whole bunch of denominations that are not true believers, Bible believers, because he said how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and he was buried. That's why we're Baptists. That's why we believe in full immersion, that, that he was fully buried, that we are buried with him in baptism and that we are raised again. Verse number four says he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This is the biblical definition of the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That, that, is, a, that is so important to understand that that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 1, 16, it's so important. He said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation. You cannot be saved without the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I thank God for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Glory to God, everybody, whosoever will, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thank God for that truth that it is for whosoever will, everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I, I love Brother Tony. I love, I love our pastor. He is a great, I believe he is one of the best preachers in America. I, I believe that, and I'm not just saying that because he asked me. I, I believe that, and, and I actually had a conversation in private with somebody else the other day, and we were talking about this. I believe he's a great pastor, and we ought to thank God for him. I know he, he stands in a hard place. He knows a lot of things that go on that uh, we don't know about, and he'll stand up here and preach in power. I thank God for that, that somebody will, will seek God for our sake. We Heaven forbid that we get offended every time we, something gets said that we don't like. But I thank God for our pastor. But recently he preached a message on the simplicity that is in Christ. Thank God that this thing of salvation, it's not complicated. I just gave you the definition, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and what do you do with it? You believe in it. It's that simple. It's not complicated. Thank God for that. But Romans 10, 9 that if thou shalt, con this is a great verse, and, and, and if you wanted to sum up the gospel in one verse, I believe you can see the components of the gospel in Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Our justification depends on the resurrection. What we just read here in Luke, the fact that Jesus showed himself, revealed himself, was the resurrected Lord, it depends, our justification in the eyes of God depends on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 4, verse 24, the Bible says, But for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again, for our justification. He was raised again so that we could be justified. He died for our sins. Glory to God for that. He paid the payment for our sins, but he got up for our justification. This is not a message. This is not a lesson on the gospel, but the resurrection is in here, so I thought it was important to at least clarify what the Bible says. And Brother Tony here has been is great. The messages, it seems like, have been on point since I've been, since I've been coming here. <laughs> 2008. Now, now I texted him shortly after I came here, and I'm not, I'm not here just to brag on Brother Tony, but I do appreciate our pastor. And uh, I texted him shortly after I started here. I told him, I said, I appreciate, when, when he, before he was pastor, I graduated the, uh, up at the school in 2003, and before he was the pastor, he would come in here and he would invest in us as young people, and Brother Matt as well up there, that they would pour their heart into it. They treated us like, like a church, like they, like they were our pastor, and they invested, and I thank God for people like that, that that'll stand up here. It wasn't just a, a time slot that they were trying to fill. They were trying to, they were trying to steer us away from the evils that, that were out there, the, the, the lures of Satan, and, and I remember I was, I was right here on this front pew, right here, because I think the, the boys that we had to sit over here and the girls over here, I remember sitting right there, and I made a life-changing decision right here had I not... He, he preached on cutting the, the sin out of your life. And I was sitting right there and I remember thinking, yeah, that's me. I thank God for, for that faithfulness. I thank God for a pastor that'll, that'll be like that. But here in the, uh, I didn't mean to say that at all. That wasn't in my notes, but I, I do appreciate our pastor. I appreciate our church. I love our church and you that are faithful to come out. But 
the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's so important. The Jehovah Witness, they, they, they have a belief that he did not physically rise from the dead. I remember working, and I, I may have mentioned this, I don't know. I, I can watch a movie three years later, and it's like a new movie because I, I, I can't remember. And I probably said this exact same thing before, but I, I worked with a Jehovah Witness one time, and, and we had some discussions about, uh, and, I, and Brother Matt had asked me to teach on uh, their doctrine. So I started studying it, and I worked with one there. And we were talking about Jesus and, and everything she was saying. I was like, that, that, that lines up exactly what we believe. She said that, that he died for our sins. And I was like, well, that's what I believe. I mean, that's what the Bible says. And then we got to the resurrection and it's like, I mean, it just took a, a turn. And, and it was, she started talking about Moses and how that Moses was buried. And I was like, yeah, that's right. That's what the Bible says. And uh, I said, what's that got to do with Jesus? And, and it's just, so... Their belief system is, is that Jesus did not rise from the dead. As a matter of fact, they, they take this, this account. You, you saw how many verses that we just, and this, this lesson's not against the Jehovah Witnesses. I, I'm just pointing out that they, they do not believe on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 16, verse number 12, there's one verse. And they take that one verse, and they have a bunch of other obscure verses, but they take this one obscure verse in Mark chapter 16, verse number 12, after that, he appeared, and when I read that, read that this morning, I'd never really paid attention to it and didn't realize that this was one of their verses that they use. But in Mark 16, 12, I had to make sure that I was reading. I got my Bible up, and I was like, is this King James? Because I, I, I didn't remember reading it. But it, listen, in Mark 16, 12, after that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And when I read that, I was like, oh, well, that's, that's an interesting statement right there that he that he appeared in another form unto them. So they take all of these verses of Scripture that we read here, that we just read, and, and they take that one verse that seems a little bit confusing, and, and they, they build a whole doctrine. They, they believe that he did not phys physically rise from the dead. They do not believe in the physical resurrection. They believe that he was a form or a spirit. But it's interesting in verse number 39, if you're still there in Luke 24, Jesus said, Behold my hands... And my feet, that I, it is I myself. Handle me and see. And, and they say that he's a spirit. And I remember having discussions with her about this. I said, but what about that passage right here? It says, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. So I, I was a little bit confused about that. There was no clear answer on that. But thank God for the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and just, just thought it was needful since we're in we're coming up on uh, Easter and we're reading about the resurrection just to point out that he did rise from the dead and he did have a physical body. And that's why it's important because some people say that he didn't. They, they start talking about the cross and that it wasn't a real cross, that it was a pole and all this stuff. I'm like, why? I mean, why would you do that? I, mean, I don't even know why you would start messing with those things. But this, this passage in verse number 39 clearly shows that Jesus had a physical body, that he physically rose from the dead. Now, the reason, and, and to explain what Mark 16, 12, and we'll move on to the, to the thought this evening and we'll be finished, but to, to point out what they said, uh, what they say about Mark 16, 12, that he appeared in another form, look at verse 16, because they say that, that he appeared in another form, therefore he, had, he was able to, uh, almost like a shape shifter, That's what it, and, and honestly, God can do what he wants, when he wants, how he wants. I mean, I, I believe he can do whatever he wants. But the Bible says, when we saw in verse number 39, that he had a physical body. He told them. But in verse number 16, their eyes, talking about these two travelers here to Emmaus, their eyes were holding that they should not know him. Their eyes were holding that they should not know him. I, I just believe, and just to explain Mark 16, 12, and we'll move on. Mark 16, 12, I, I just believe that it was similar to uh, Mary, you know, she was over there and she was at the tomb and she saw someone. And the Bible says in John, I think it's in John chapter 20, verse number 14, the end of it, it says, she knew not that it was Jesus. So she saw somebody and, and this Mary, uh, Magdalene, I believe it was, she, she knew the Lord. She had been with the Lord. So she would recognize the Lord. And it wasn't that he was in another form uh, that like, you know, some super weird, I don't know, shape-shifting 
form, not a body. I believe that it was a physical body. She just didn't know that it was him. I believe that we could make that comparison in Mark 16 because it says, supposing him to be the gardener. They were just so perplexed that the, the Savior that they believed was the Messiah, they were just so perplexed that he had died and they had so much hope that he was, he was going to be the Redeemer. As a matter of fact, it says, I think in the passage that we read, we trust, verse 21, we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. I believe that they were, they were just, they just couldn't even see him. They just couldn't see who he was because of their unbelief. We'll see here in just a minute. So I believe that just to cast out doubt about what the Jehovah Witnesses believe on that, I don't believe it's a, a shape-shifting form. I believe he, he, what the Bible says, it doesn't matter if I believe it or not, the Bible says he had a physical body. And, and don't take one little verse that you can read in Luke chapter 24 where we are. There's how many verses? I don't even know how many, 20 some verses there that explain the event. And they take the one verse that is, you know, it's just one verse. It's all of that condensed into one verse. And they're like, see there? So just be careful. And you, we got to be careful. You know how the, and I feel like I'm not trying to attack the Jehovah Witness. And, and, and I prayed for this, this person. And, and I, I hope that they get saved. And, and if they don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then they are not saved according to the Bible. But anyway, verse number 16, their eyes were holding that they should not know him. They were, they were, there was something going on. One commentator stated this about this passage. It seems that more is meant here than their physical eyes. In verse 31, we are told that their eyes were opened. Later in the same chapter, speaking of the ten disciples, we are told, then opened he their understanding. In verse number 45, taking these further verses into account, it seems that there was a supernatural power that caused them to be blind toward Christ when he was so near to them. Kind of like that passage over there in Romans chapter 11, verse 25. And this is a mystery, by the way, that blindness in part is happened to Israel. It's hard to explain that one. But the Bible says that blindness in part is happening to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles is coming in. So, and let us not be fooled that God, some people say that, that uh, the church has re replaced Israel. Let's not be fooled in that, th this, uh, this replacement theory. God God is not finished with Israel. Paul said, don't boast yourself in Romans chapter 11. So there is blindness in part that happened to Israel. So I believe that there's some supernatural things going on here in these verses that their eyes were holding that they should not know him, similar to Romans chapter 25. But the thought this evening, and the thought that I had on my way to work, and that I want to give you tonight is this, is just the, their walk and our walk. I just want to draw some parallels between their walk that we see in these verses and, and our walk, our walk in this life. Number one, notice their destination. Verse number 13, notice their destination. I didn't just spit out tobacco. I just had a piece of gum. Sorry. It looked like I was in oh, you know, tobacco. Well, that stuff's nasty. I have some people that I know that do it, and one time it got on me. It was, well, <laughs> oh, that was just nasty. I've never been, I've, uh, well, I just, uh, oh, that makes me sick. Just think of it. Verse 13, and behold, two of them went that same day, talking about their destination, that same day to a village called Emmaus. Now, when I was thinking about this driving on my way to work, this is the way my mind thinks. I, I, wanted, I wanted to find something really cool in the Old Testament about Emmaus and be like, oh, this is where God came down and Elijah was, you know, I wanted to find something. And this is the only time that Emmaus is in the Bible and, and all the other stuff that I read, I'm like, did this place even exist? The only reason I know it exists is because the, the Bible says it right here. There was nothing else that I could find. I was like, well, that's a, that's a bummer. So I don't have a, a, any deep theological truths to convey about this village called Emmaus. But one thing I did notice, notice what it says, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. That three score furlongs is about seven miles. Now, y'all know what Jerusalem is. It's, when, I, when I was thinking about this, I, I didn't read this anywhere, but Jerusalem in the Bible, it's a place of worship. You know, when, when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well 
over there, she, she kind of got offended and, and she, she kind of puffed up and she said, we can't even go to Jerusalem because, you know, she was a Samaritan. She's like, the Jews go over there and worship, but we can't even go over there and worship. And, and uh, John 4, 20, she said, our fathers worshiped in this mountain. So like, this is the only place that we can worship. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So Jerusalem, they understood in that day that Jerusalem was a, a, a place of worship. And I understand that the Passover had just happened and, and they're, they're coming over and there's some things going on. They're, they're leaving Jerusalem. But I, I believe they were supposed to either be in Jerusalem at the time or they were supposed to go over into Galilee. And the thing that, that caught my attention when I was looking at this is that Emmaus was not the place that they should have been. They should have been in Jerusalem. What, and what that, what that represents is that they, Jerusalem was a place of worship, and what they were doing is they were leaving the place of worship. And, and I just, I've been telling the Sunday school class, I've been burdened for our church. I do not want us to leave the place of true worship I believe that God has greatly blessed this church, and I thank God for it, just like I was talking about. Let us not be the generation here at New Manna that takes the true worship and walks away from God. Let us come in with a true heart. That's what Jesus told the woman at the well. He said, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. Let us come to church looking to worship Him. Let us come to work in truth and in spirit. Let us be filled with the Holy Ghost. I remember Brother, Tom, uh, Brother Tim Shirley preached a message one time and he's talking about the, the man of God. And we come in here and we expect to be sitting there and, and, and Him just pour His heart out and us just sit there and do nothing. And let us be filled with the Spirit just as He is filled with the Spirit. That is the expectation that God has for us. Let us be filled With God's Spirit, help us to be true worshipers. I I don't want our church to go away from true worship. I don't. I don't want to be. I don't want to be fake. Uh, We need to be real. That's that's what I mentioned to the Sunday school class. I think just recently, I I want my girls to grow up in something that is real. I want them to know what is real. I want them to go to another church. Maybe maybe they'll go to another church sometime, and and maybe it's not. It's just not like this. And, and they, can, they can determine based on experience, well, well that, ain't, that ain't like it was when I was a kid. That's, that's not, that ain't right. I want them to know what true worship is. And you know, that, that just, doesn't just depend on me. That doesn't just depend on Brother Tony. He's a great part of that. But that that's, that's us. That's us. I want, our, I want our families, our families need help. We need to come in here, true worshipers. We need to worship in spirit and truth. Help us. We need to be real. I don't, I don't want to play church. I don't want to come in here and just play church and just do the things that we always done. I want it to come in here and I want it to be real. I want God to move in. I want God to meet with us and he does and I thank God for that. But make sure, make sure that you're watching your soul. Make sure you're watching yourself. I taught on the watchman the other day and the Lord convicted me about that. Let's be, and maybe, maybe you're, you've got a close walk with the Lord, but maybe there's somebody that you have influence on that you could be that watchman to warn them. Let us, let's not play church. Let's be true worshipers. Their, their destination was to Emmaus. It was away from the place of worship. But notice their communication. They're talking about some things. Verse number 14. And they talked together of all the things which had happened. Just the crucifixion, the, the, the things that they had... Verse number 18, the things, these things which had happened, look in verse number 18, and one of them whose name was Cleopas answering said unto them, Art thou a stranger in Jerusalem? Hast thou not known the things which are come to pass? They were talking about these things, and Jesus said, What things? He, wanted to, he knew. <laughs> I mean, he was the he. He knew. Look at what it says. They said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth. Now, at first glance, you're probably thinking that's great. They're talking about Jesus. They're talking about a different Jesus, <laughs> just like those Jehovah Witness. When when I was first talking, and I'm not trying to bash them, and if you 
If you are a Jehovah Witness in here, I'd be glad to talk with you tonight if you want to come up to me. Um, if you've left that faith or, or maybe you have influence from that, I, I don't know. I'd be glad to talk with you. But I'm not trying to bash them. But if when I was talking with this person that I worked with and she was talking about Jesus and I was talking about Jesus, it almost sounded like we're talking about talking about the same Jesus. But when we got to that resurrection, that ain't the same Jesus. My Savior rose from the dead. Hers is still dead. Mine physically got up with a body. And when I was reading this, and I, th- I saw their communication that they're talking about Jesus. But look, look at verse number 20. Look what they said. This is the Jesus they're talking about. The chief priests and our rulers delivered him, Jesus, to be condemned to death and have crucified him. They were, And, and there's another denomination, if you will, that focus in on, on the death. And they leave him dead. They leave him on a cross. Hint, hint, the Catholics, they have a, they have a very... Power, influ- powerful influence, even in a lot of churches, like uh, Bible, what may be Bible, considered Bible believing churches, some of their influence still comes in and creeps in today. He's not dead, he is risen. They were, their, the topic of their conversation, their communication was about Jesus. The problem was is that they, they had left him dead. They were talking about him as if he was a has been. Verse number 19 at the end of it, which was a prophet mighty indeed was a prophet mighty indeed. Verse number 21, but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. They were talking about him as if he had, was a has been. We know he's not a has been. We know, I, I love what he declared in Revelation chapter one. He said, I am Alpha, I am the Omega, I, the beginning and the ending saith the Lord, which is and was and which is to come, the Almighty. Uh, he ain't no has been, he was. He is, and He is to come, the Almighty God. Revelation chapter 1. I'm I'm not insinuating that things must be the way they were back in the day. You know, people talk about back in the day. You know, back in the, I, I'm not saying that. I, I know things are going to be different. I know that times are going to go, it's going to get worse. Things are going to happen. And But I, I'm just saying that He can be just as real to us in this time as He was to those Back in the day, people, I think Brother Tony uses this several, or a lot, Ezra chapter 3, verse 12 and 13. But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house, talking about Solomon's temple, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice and many shouted aloud for joy. Some of them were crying because they're just saying it's just not as good as it used to be. Heaven forbid that that should be us. I'm not, I'm not trying to beat anybody up. I feel like I'm being real hateful. I don't, I'm not trying to be hateful. I, I just want our church. I just want to help our church. I, let's, let us not be the one saying, well, it just ain't what it used to be. Well, maybe it's not, but it can be just as real as it was back then. It may not be the same, but it can be just as real as it was. But he is just as real. He's the same. He's the same so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. Heaven forbid that people can't tell if we're happy or sad. They should be able to tell that we're joyous, that we're glad that he is the same God. That not only notice their communication, that he, they were looking at him as someone that was still dead, someone that was a has-been. This is an interesting word. It actually, I knew it from Spanish, so that's how I knew it. I'll think of words in Spanish and then look them up to make sure that they're English words. This is one of those. Castigation, castigar. Notice the castigation, verse number 25. It means to reprimand, just in case. Notice the castigation, verse 25. Then he said unto them, O fools, <laughs> and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And this was harsh language. Oh, fools. He was lumping them right in there with the, uh, the fool that said in his heart, there is no God. That's, that's some pretty harsh language he used there. But he was reprimanding them for not knowing this. He said, ought not Christ to have suffered these things? He said, you should have known, you should have known this. Should, verse number 26, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? It seems that they believed some of the prophets, <laughs> but not all of them. They like to take those verses that make me feel good about the Messiah, that he's going to come and he's going to conquer, but I don't want those verses in Isaiah 53 where he's going to have to suffer. I, I, I don't want those. And, and that's, uh, he called them fools. He said, ought not Christ to have suffered? Yeah. 
It already been prophesied. Another commentator made an observation regarding this passage. Jesus first rebuked these two men for their spiritual dullness, and then he went on to show them from the whole Testament, Old Testament, beginning with Moses and culminating in the prophets, that the Messiah was prophesied to suffer and to be glorified. Listen, while it is not spelled out, I understand Jesus to be saying it was not enough to grant that Messiah's suffering was somehow compatible with his glory. It is not enough to grant that suffering was a means to his glory. But listen to this. Suffering was a part of his glory. He had to suffer. It had already been prophesied. As a matter of fact, in Revelation, he went on to say, take careful note that the worship of the Messiah in heaven is the worship of the one who was slain. His suffering is worshipped in heaven. Be careful. He was telling them, be careful. Or he, he said, ought not Christ to have suffered? Don't take just partial truth from the Bible. Take the whole word. Now, there are some things that God expects us to know. I see what time it is. I won't be much longer. There are some things that God expects us to know Verse number one, I recently taught in Sunday school, let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, I had recently taught that, and I was in a, mess, or I was in a meeting somewhere recently, and uh, the preacher was saying, I, how many of you even know any, one mystery of God? And I was thinking, uh, I, I just taught that, so I know at least one, and one was the mystery of godliness. I was like, thank the Lord. The mystery of godliness. And, and there's, there's, there's other mysteries. I think there's like 11 of them. But do, do you know any of them? We, we are to be stewards. It's hard to be stewards of something that you don't even know anything about. God expects us to know. He expected them to know these things. And he expects us to know some things. He expects us to be ministers, stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, I know it's been negative up until this, this point. And we've, we've, we've made observation of the destination. It was negative. They're going away from the worship, the communication. They're focusing on a dead Jesus, a has-been Jesus, the castigation. They were, they were met with harsh reality in that they just didn't believe all the scriptures. But let's look at some positive aspects found in this account. Look at uh, verse number 27. Let's look at the explanation. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded in them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. That word expounded just means to explain. That's why I called it the explanation. To lay open the meaning, to clear of obscurity, to interpret. When I, when I was studying this and I was looking at it, you know, I was thinking I'd love to have like a, a deep, deep message. You know, just some really deep truths. And, and I was looking at it and, and it said in verse 27, and beginning at Moses. And I was like, all right, so why is he talking about Moses, Moses, Moses? And then the Lord just today revealed unto me, he wasn't talking about the man, Moses. He was talking about his writings. I mean, in context, if you look at verse 44, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled. What? The scriptures. Which were written in the law of Moses. So there, when he makes reference to Moses, he's not talking about the man, Moses. I mean, more than likely, he, he probably mentioned Moses because now, I recently heard a preacher say this, and I'm going to say it here. Uh, he said that, that uh, men in the Bible should represent one of two people. They should represent Christ, a type of Christ, or they should represent, or they represent the Antichrist. It's one of two. And, and that women in the Bible represent the church or the harlot. I mean, those, those are some very contrasting things. It's, it, it's interesting. But anyway, he probably did mention Moses, but here he's talking about the writings, the Pentateuch more than likely, the first five books. He probably mentioned some of those things. I, we don't know what he said, but I, I know that in, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, 18, it says uh, that he, he that talking about Jesus, that when he comes, God said, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee and will put my words in his mouth. I'm at Jesus Christ and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. I'll raise them up a prophet. It's capital P. In John chapter 7, verse number 40, the Bible says, Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said of a truth, this is the prophet. Maybe, they, maybe he mentioned to them about the son. Psalms chapter 2, verse number 7, I will declare a decree. This is God speaking. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. And I think I mentioned that recently, but I, I thank God that when... And if you look in, in Psalm chapter 2, it's hard to, to see 
any prophetic uh, application there, but right there it is. It says, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. We know that in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We know that he is the begotten. But right there in verse number 8 of Psalms, ta- Psalms chapter 2, it says, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. And you know who the heathen, you know who that is? That's us. That's, that's, that's the Gentiles. I'm not a Gentile anymore. I'm saved. And I mentioned that Sunday. I'm saved. Thank God that I'm washed in the blood, that I'm no longer an outcast. I'm no longer in the uh, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. Paul said in Ephesians, I'm grateful that when he said, God told his son, he said, I'll give you the heathen for the inheritance. I'm grateful that Jesus said, I'll take them. He said that... Uh, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession, that God, that he, he said, I'll take them. Maybe he, he told them about the forsaken one, Psalm 21, or Psalms 22, verse number one, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And there's so many other things that God could have revealed unto him. Maybe he talked about Isaiah 53, how that he would be, he would be beaten. I, I don't know what he preached, but I do know this. Look at verse 32. And they said, and this, all of this scripture that he's expounding and that he's explaining to them, he didn't tell them who he was. And they didn't know who he was when he was doing all this. He, you know what he did? And this is the interesting part right here. He let the scripture speak for itself. This is the word of God. The word was with God. The word was God. This is him talking. The word was talking. And he, he thought so much of his word that he didn't even reveal to them who he was. He said, I, I'm going to tell them. I'm going to expound the things concerning myself, but I'm going to let the scriptures speak for themselves. And you know why they can? Because they're powerful. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that they're sharper than any two-edged sword. He could let, if, if somebody comes to you with a verse of scripture, most of the time, if you can't understand it, you can just let, you can just let the, the word speak for itself. The scripture speak for, the self, for itself. I don't know who or what scriptures he gave them, but I know he's talking about himself. And look at verse number 32. He didn't reveal himself until after all of this. And it said, they said one to another, did not our heart heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Let me ask you a question. When somebody stands and preaches, when somebody opens the scripture and they tell you of things in, in, in the Bible about our Lord, the one that we just talked about rising from the dead and the reason he died was for our sins, when we hear about these things, does it burn in your heart? It should. Uh, it should. It should stir in our soul that he would have anything to do with us. I know sometimes I'm sitting there, I'm just, uh, it's just, it's convicting that he'd have anything to do with us. It should burn in our heart when somebody says something about the Lord. It's like, yeah, that's my God. He's the one that loved me. I, I love him, but it's only because he first loved me. It should drive us to want to live for him. It it should burn in our heart. Then we notice, lastly, the revelation. The revelation, verse number 31. And their eyes were opened, (laughs) and they knew him. It's interesting to note that he didn't reveal himself before he expounded the Scriptures. He let the Scriptures speak for themselves. 1 Corinthians 2.12 says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us. I'm not working to get to heaven. I'm not not working for my salvation. These, These truths that I have, the gospel, I'm not working for the gospel. It was freely given. But the reason I know about the gospel and the reason that I believe the gospel is because one day God, through the Holy Ghost, came and revealed unto me the things that I might know, that I might believe on Him, that I might be saved. The revelation. Thank God for the day that He revealed Himself unto me. And this walk that we see that they had, it started, it started bumpy. It started negative. Or, you know, those negative things. Their destination. They were led away from their worship. Their place of worship, if you will. But it was redirected. Look at verse number 33. So after he expounded the scriptures and after he revealed himself, things change when you walk with the Lord. Uh, You'll walk different. You will. I mean, you'll be different. 
We need to be different. Look at verse 33. And they rose up the same hour. Look where they went. (laughs) They returned to Jerusalem. And if you're in here tonight, I don't know who you are, who it may be, but maybe you have walked away from Jerusalem. You're, you're, like, you're like them when they first started. You're sad, whatever. The reason may be, maybe you're at a place in your life that you, you've just you've walked away from that true worship. Just, just ask. I've been asking the Lord. Just There's a scripture in Jeremiah, turn thou me. And I've been asking, because if he don't turn us, we're not going to turn. We, I, I ain't got it in myself to do it. I just, I know me. I ain't going to do it. Let us walk with the Lord. Let us walk with the Lord. And if we do, we will return. We'll be redirected. We'll go back to the place of, place of worship. Their communication was corrected. <laughs> Look at verse number 34. Look what they start saying. The Lord is risen indeed. They're talking about a dead Savior before, dead what they thought was Messiah, a has-been. Now they're saying, He's, He is alive. He is risen. And then their castigation <laughs> Turn into consolation. Verse 36. And as they spoke, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. He consoled them. At first he was saying, Thou fools, you should have known this. But then he came back around and he's like, It's okay. I'm going to give you peace. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve peace. Thank God that he doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us mercy and he gives us grace. Lord, I love you tonight. Thank you for your word. I'm grateful that it speaks for itself. I pray that you'd help us as a church. Lord, we're going into next, next week. And I know things always happen. That uh, spiritual warfare, I know it always amps up. But I, I pray that you'd have mercy on our church. We need your help. Our family needs your help. And I hope you were blessed by the service. And if there's anything else that we could do for you, please reach out and let us know. We want to serve you as best we can. But before I let you go, I just want to deal with this one thing. If you were to die... Today, do you know for sure that you'd go to heaven? You know, the Bible teaches that you can know that. It's a very simple thing. Let me just share it with you if I could. First of all, you've got to realize that you're a sinner. Now, I'm not insulting you. We're all sinners. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And uh, we all know that we're not perfect and there are things in our lives that we wish we could do better. And those sins are why we must be saved. See, heaven's not a good place. Heaven's a perfect place. No sin can enter in. And so that sin must be taken care of. So you have to realize that you're a sinner. And then secondly, you have to recognize that Jesus is the answer for that. And so you've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. One man came to the apostles and he said, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you've got to believe that Jesus was born of a virgin and that he lived a perfect and sinless life and that he then died on the cross and shed his perfect blood to save us from our sins. And that he rose again that third day victorious over death, hell, and the grave. You see, that's the gospel. You have to put your faith and realize that the gospel is the answer for your sin problem. And then last of all, what you do is then you then receive the Lord as your Savior. You say, well, I, I don't know how to do that. Well, it's very simple. And it simply just means this, that you must call on the Lord. The Bible said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's a promise that if you would just bow your heart to God, And you'd call out to him and tell him that you know that you're a sinner. Because of that sin, if you died, you'd have to go to hell, but that you don't want to. And you would ask him to forgive you of those sins and to save you. And you would receive him into your heart as the Savior. And what will happen is the blood of Jesus would wash your sins away forever. And you could know for sure, based on the promises of the Word of God, that if you were to die, that heaven would be your home for all eternity. Well, we'd love to help you with this. And if there's anything else we can do, please, again, reach out to us. God bless you.